Hi, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of my podcast, Subcast. This episode, we have an interview with the man, Monkey, from the band The Addicts. In on stage, he's a incredibly theatric, vivacious frontman, throwing around all types of confetti, and he's got the bowler hat, and they have the Clockwork Orange aesthetic, and he has the the clown makeup on and the giant grin, and and um. He's really just an intelligent, lovely human being and sat down and we talked for over an hour. So this is a long interview, so I'm going to try to make the intro short. Um, we have a show back downtown. Brown is going to be backing up HR of Bad Brains once again on this Saturday, the 24th of August. And it's for what's called the 9th Annual Rock and Roll Carnival presented by musac.org, M U S A ck.org and we're going to be there with tim armstrong of rancid the untouchables shepherd fairy's doing a dj set fred armazon's going to be there it's going to be weird so if you're in the launch los angeles area and you have a hundred dollars to burn that you want to donate so some kids uh in impoverished areas can get instruments the adult ticket is a hundred dollars and you can get it on musac.org m-u-s-a-c-k.org if you want to come see hr of Bad Brains, do some reggae stuff, and Tim Armstrong is going to be there playing Ramon songs. It's going to be weird, and we're going to be there on Saturday. Yes. So back to the episode. Um, I was told by my producer that last week I was doing this a lot, so I'm going to try to stay still. I'm going to try to make eye contact with the camera because I am on camera. Should My eyes just shouldn't be darting around. But those of you listening, you can't tell what my body's doing, so I could be doing this the whole time. And I mean, would it really matter? Would it really matter? No, but this is on video. As well. So I have to be mindful of these things. I'm working this out. This is only episode three. But we're back in the van. We have Monkey from the Attics. And he tells us all types of interesting stuff about his life. And uh, when he was not touring with the Attics, they took a few years. I don't know if they took a... There was a little lull in their activity. He was an archaeologist. So little known fact, Monkey from the Attics is also an archaeologist. And I did not know that until we sat in the van with them. You learn all types of crazy stuff when you sit down and have a long discussion with human beings. And that's what we're exploring in this podcast. We're getting to know people, listening to their stories, and I'm deriving little tidbits of knowledge and, and different ways of looking at my own life from these conversations. And I feel already three up episodes in to doing this thing, I have new f- outlooks on things. And you'll see as the episode is going along, I'm like, hey, he's right. I should think about things a little bit differently. And it happened with HR. It happened with Monkey from the Addicts. And it happened then the first episode when I just sat there talking to myself for an hour. So we're growing together in this podcast. We are becoming more enlightened and we are growing together. So let's get on with it. Let's not go like this, and let's look into the camera for episode three of my podcast, Subcast. Let's go. This is you, bud. Can he shoot over a tiny bit? More to the right? Yeah, yeah. You you have room either way, left or right. Yeah. Yeah, but we're not too close to each other. Yeah. We can. can, (laughs) It'll get kind of weird. I can smell that coffee on you. We we got close there. That's all you can smell these days. And in all honesty, I didn't think we'd get set up this quickly. So, this is episode three of my podcast, Supcast, S U P C A S T. And I'm here with Monkey from the Addicts, who was gracious enough to want to get in the van. And do the damn thing. Uh, I've spent most of my life in a van, so, you know, what's another hour? Mostly. You. Yeah, here we are. Another hour in a van. So it's just, <laughs> this is. This, this, one, this one isn't going anywhere, so sometimes. Yeah, this is a stationary vehicle, and this is, I actually, this is my personal vehicle. I drive this to work, and I, the band tours in it and whatnot, and I used to live in this thing when it, I first. Yeah, I when, thought I could smell <laughs> some lingering Neil odor. 
Yeah, actually, we I just sprayed in here just to make sure there wasn't ah, any of that. Nice, so, nice. are you being serious? Do you actually smell lingering me? No, I smell something fresh. It's orange. Oh, it's the natural orange spray. Um, we call it the fart spray. Oh, I think I, yes. Okay, but. But yeah, thanks for coming out. We are we are currently parked. The van is parked in Thousand Oaks, California, and I'm here with Monkey from the Attics. And where should we start? Should we start at the beginning? The beginning of what? Your life. Oh, no, I'm, I'm 1959. You mean? Uh, yeah, I'm interested to know these type of things because how, how I was conceived well i could sit here and i could ask you like so where did you get the name the addicts from or i could be like when did you decide to punk rock and just you know like all the shit you've been asking me yeah. times. or we could we could i'm just kind of interested to know like with doing this podcast getting to know people like the the first guest i had was hr from bad brains and that was it was it was an intense interview because he's like a, a really soft-spoken guy and he's a man of God, mm-hmm. so I couldn't say fucking shit and be m- my normal self. His en- energy level is very serene. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm kind of a spazzy guy. So talking to him, I w- I was like had to get down to his level and you know s- kind of energy level. And uh, I feel like you feel okay to swear w- w- around me. Yeah. Okay. I f- well, I I just feel like th- I could. I don't know. I I'm, just, not, I'm not a man of God. I respect everybody's opinions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's not That's not for me. So you swear as much as you fucking want to. Yeah, let's go. But but yeah. But, anyway, back to 1959. Yeah, this this can be just a, a conversation. It doesn't have to, we don't have to necessarily sit here and talk about what being in a band is, which you just said. It's like a lot of it is just sitting in a van, traveling, hurry up and wait, that right. whole lifestyle. So let's let's find out about you, man. Okay. 1959? Yes. I was born in uh, some kind of nursing home in uh, a place called Ipswich in the county of Suffolk in England uh, to, you know, simple working class parents. I think they, actually when I was born, I think they lived with uh, my mother's parents. So, you know, it was, uh, I mean, they never really uh, uh, aspired to much, just simple people with simple lives kind of happy enough you know how i got to be uh some kind of degenerate with a wanderlust out of that uh marriage i don't know but there we go now as far as the geography of of england is concerned that's that's separate from great britain i'm kind of dumb as far as all this stuff you is certainly concerned. are okay <laughs> <laughs> separate from great britain i mean uh, isn't it two separate things Two separate actual landforms? Not landforms, but like, isn't no. there like a div- dividing line? Ah, it's more complicated than it should be. So you've got England, Scotland, and Wales, and Northern Ireland. So then you've got that as Great Britain, and then you've got the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Okay. Uh, it's just all political, um, you know, borders really. There's nothing. So the that. UK is all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay. I I'm dumb. Right. That's why I asked. No, I, um, so I'm English. I don't. I first and foremost consider myself English rather than British. I think because that's like the you know Scots and the Welsh wouldn't say they're British. They're fervently Welsh and fervently Scottish. They you know dislike the English quite a lot because of the political situation. Right. Um, Which did when you were growing and, up, and and you know there was another royal born today to so add to the pile of uh, you know leeches from the royal family. That, you know. What do you think of uh, John Lydon, Johnny Rotten's uh, comments about the homeless people in Venice? Did you read anything about that? I caught something about him saying that it, they, he was annoyed that they were hanging out around invading his privacy or something like this. I, I didn't read details. but According to what I read yesterday, uh, there was a homeless person on his front lawn. And I guess he's taking care of his wife that's suffering from dementia. Yeah. So, and yeah, a lot of people were like, you're a sellout. But it's like, I don't know. That guy's kind of on his front how, lawn. How, how much do you have to give to not be a sad i mean it's uh, he's entitled to his privacy as much as anybody else is yeah i figured that's his front lawn he he, i mean in in his he's quoted just saying i want to be able to leave my house and take care of my wife without having a guy on my front lawn but uh but anyway let's let's go back to Mm. 
Let's go back to your humble beginnings. Um, well, that was it. Just uh, uh, grew up on a council estate, which is basically uh, I don't know, maybe American equivalent would be the projects, I guess. Just you know, low rent for low income families. That you, know, you don't own the property; you just rent it from the local government. You know? Small red brick terraced houses, the little backyards where people would you know try and grow their own. Uh, Grow their own vegetables and, you know, where the dog could run. I mean, but, you know, a nice sense of community. Um, and you know, a relatively safe place to grow up in. I mean, there's always, uh, you know, there's an undercurrent of crime there. but um, Kind of in a, in a Jack the Lad kind of, uh, you know, have a go way. Everyone was kind of had their own little sideline. You know, you would steal from wherever you worked. You would probably steal something from. Then you would trade it with the other guy. My dad worked in a brewery, so we always had beer. Nice. So we would trade the beer with sausages from the guy that worked in the in the at the butchers, or you know, or um, bread from the bakery or something like that. I mean, this is you know, but everyone would steal from work, and then you would. You know, you had the guys come around with the bootleg videos and, you know, people would knock on the door with, you know, knock off videos or, or TVs or stuff like that. It was, you know, uh, it's kind of fun in a way. It sounds, yeah, it sounds different. Mm. I grew up in the suburbs in Michigan. It was, yeah, I grew up pretty, I grew up kind of privileged, um, my parents like weren't a ton of debt. They just were trying to get us into good schools. Yeah, and that's pretty. Well, it, there's there's no chance of that in the neighborhood that I grew up in. You know, you just would kind of push through the system. Yeah, you know, and, and I mean, it's, I didn't quit school. I'd quit. I I was done with school when I was sixteen. But at fifteen, I'd probably given up and wasn't really going very much towards the end. And then at sixteen, you pushed out, and I was. Uh, you know, you expect to go to go get a job at a local factory. Really, that's at sixteen. Yeah. You expect that's expected. This was back in the you know long, long time ago. Yeah, mid seventies. Like nine seventy five was when I finished school with no qualifications whatsoever, and that was pretty much the standard for everybody in, in the area. So, yeah. what would your would your options be for like a job at um, that age? What, in Ipswich, there were some big engineering firms. That um, may agricultural implements and I don't know, just I think it was out of steel. I don't really know. Um, so, I wasn't really interested in that, but my dad managed to somehow get me a job that I didn't really want in engineering. So I started off being an apprentice welder, which is something I had no interest or uh, aptitude for. It's a tough but, trade, too. Um, yeah. So we, we, I had to go to this training school and just. And uh, you were 16 when? Yeah. Wow. So it's pretty like industrial town, kind of industrial on one side, but also agricultural on the other side. It's a very rural area. Uh, okay, um, it's uh, geographically very flat. So lots of uh, you know wheat and barley fields, and mostly uh, more more arable farming than than dairy. Um, and, and you know we kind of grew up close to the countryside. We would just jump on our bicycles and. Ride down a couple of streets, and then you'd be in a country lane, you know. And that was kind of the way we spent our summers, really. It's just riding bikes around out in the country and chasing rabbits and stuff like that. That sounds kind of fun. It's very uh, bucolic. Yeah. <laughs> so, how long did the welding thing last? Six months. I just wasn't for me, and I didn't like. Again, I would just I'd left school, and at around about sixteen, I started to have a sense of rebellion to understand that okay i don't really have to do what i'm expected to do there are other ways to look at life and other ways to you know look at your future and it doesn't necessarily have to be working in a factory and getting married having kids and, and saving for retirement you know there's more to it than that there are ways out um so I was in this job that I didn't like, and I just said, uh, fuck this, I'm just going to 
I don't want to do this. I'll do something else. I didn't know what it was, but I just stopped doing what I didn't like until I found something I did like. Is there something that sparked you being like, I don't want to be in this position or, or was there anything that inspired you to take that leap? Or just being a teenager, really. You're just, yeah, you're just like, fuck it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, no, I, I, and we, we used to fuck around at this, this job all the time. I was the champion at hiding in the, hiding in the toilets for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, got, I think I got it up to 75 minutes before I got caught. But, you know, uh, it was so you'd be on the clock hiding? We are on the clock, and this, you, yeah, <laughs> you'd go and hide in the toilet until the instructor came and knocked on the door. Warren, I know you're in there. Okay, sir. I was the record holder briefly. Well, I don't know. It may be a record that still stands. I don't know. People are more, uh, uh, you know. It'd be funny. Your name's on the wall. There's a, like a picture of you on the wall. Yeah, we used to draw things on the wall, I think, <laughs> that were somewhat rude. But, you know, I just realized that it wasn't for me, that whole, that lifestyle. And it's, it's for some it is, but for me it wasn't. So I just got out of that and did nothing for a while. Mm. What, so what what did you do after you got out of that like what what i got another what was job nothing? i did like nothing just typical layabout unemployment stuff then i got another job working at um a ship's chandlers it was like on the which has a as a, a river estuary that runs like 12 miles it runs from the north sea and the river runs up so it's like uh you know, it's a port town. There's a dock there, and historically, it's always been like an important like trade route. Um, and so there was this company there that made these giant uh, canvas sails for like old style sailing barges. And so I worked at a place that did that, and I actually learned how to splice ropes and do some wire work and stuff like that. Again, a few months of that. No, this is. Not it. So. so you just got sick of doing whatever regular job pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I didn't like getting up. I didn't like <laughs> being where I wanted to be. The, when I worked at this, uh, it was called J O Whitmalls. It was kind of an old, kind of well respected company. And I used to work there, but also my friends that didn't have jobs would go to the youth club on in the afternoons because it would you know, be open for the unemployed. So, excuse me, I got a little bit of a cold. Um. So there was a place for the unemployed to go, and they could play uh, uh, snooker, or billiards, and have free coffee and stuff like that. So I used to bunk off work and go there instead, you know, because I'd rather be hanging out with my mates. So, um, were a lot of those guys you went to school with? Uh, yeah, almost all, because we you know we were, we were all tight in the neighborhood. Because it was a small town. Well, the town itself was one hundred and twenty thousand people. Oh, okay. But you know, we all grew up in separate neighborhoods, so you might not know so many people from the other side of the town, but you pretty much knew everybody in your in your neighborhood. What well, we called it the estate, a council estate. And so our estate was called Gainsborough, named after the famous painter Thomas Gainsborough. Okay. And all the streets were named after um famous painters. I lived on Lancia, which is named after Edwin Lancia. He painted the blue boy. So you had all these nice ideas of, you know, pretty pictures and, you know, on shitty streets, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny juxtaposition. Yeah, there. Yeah. Pretty pictures, shitty streets. Uh, um, yeah, so I just drifted out, you know, out of a couple of jobs. and I end, Then I ended up working at a brewery just down the street. That's where my dad worked. Hey, boy, you want a job? Well, not really. Oh, come on, I'll get you one. So, okay. So I just went, I never, I mean, back then, again, 70s, very loose, you know. Just go Monday morning, go see Tommy. Oh, okay. So I just went to the brewery Monday morning. I says, Tommy, around here, he's over there. Tommy, I'm Ken's boy. All right, we'll start over there, you know, smashing those bottles or whatever. And that was it. I just, you know, yeah. That's how you got jobs back then, you know. There's no online resume no 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 i didn't have to monster.com no no interview just, no cv no uh, no background check <laughs> right so how long did that last uh i worked at the brewery for about a year i think so i even worked there when i was even legally too young to work there because it was a brewery there's alcohol you have to be 18 that's the drinking age over there yeah is it still the drinking age over there yeah okay as far as I know, I worked. I think I started working there when I was seventeen. 
But yeah, no, drinking age 18, you could go in a pub at 14 with an adult, and at 16, I think you could go in on your own, but you couldn't buy alcohol. Um, it may have changed now. It's been a, a while since I've lived in the UK, but again, we had back in the 70s, you had no ID card. So you could go in a pub, and the legal responsibility of the barman or the landlord, landlord was to ask you how old you were. That's it. Are you 18? <laughs> yes, I am, sir. <laughs> I have a pint of bitter, please. And they, if they believed you were 18, they could serve you. And if they believed you weren't, then you wouldn't. But so there were certain pubs that you could go to that you knew. At, at, at While well, I was still at school, 15 or 16, we would go to pubs and... We could know. We knew that we would get. We would get served there, you know. Even though our voices hadn't broken and we didn't have much pubic hair, we could <laughs> get a couple of beers, you know. That's that's so weird. It's just on the discretion of the the person at the pub. Yeah, it's not like that anymore, though. Oh no, yeah. we have barcodes no, now. No, no, fuck you. No. We have uh, RFID chips in our IDs. That's wild. Yeah, that'll be that's uh, inserted soon, and you know yeah, we'll all be the sign of the beast. absorbed into the technology. So I, I saw some uh, we'll something on one. TV this morning, uh, uh, briefly about some news report about you know kids and devices and you know how that, that's taken over. It's it's it is you know a precursor to some dystopian future where man and technology are. are coexist in, in some form in some being i think you know i feel like we're we're on the precipice of that there's there's a company called boston boston dynamics and uh they've been making these robots that are capable of like walking on their own yeah and it, it's gotten to the point in the last 10 years where now they can like jump and do you know open doors they can run right it's kind of creepy but is that is that possibly though that the way that it evolution will go and that you know the human being will become obsolete is what, what what do you need humans for anyway i mean well you've seen the matrix right uh, yeah we're we're pests but um yeah. i think it's there's there's a lot that could happen with like replacement of limbs and you know like fixing of spinal cords i mean i'm sure there's a lot oh, there's of amazing uh, things that can be done yeah sure. yeah but who knows if i mean yeah, I talk all the time about when Skynet becomes aware and kills us all and Terminator 2 is actually a real thing. Like it I mean it's it's definitely yeah. possible. I think I think it's a little in the future though. I think we ha still have some time where we can be humans and not worry about all that. But it, it it is getting weird. There's a lot of there's a lot of research and stuff. The younger the younger generation are more depressed and suicidal. Yeah. Because of the advent of social media. And, yeah, I find myself scrolling. I mean, I, I saw you just, you're on Instagram now. I did. I just started last week, and already I think, oh, I, uh, this is a lot, you know. <laughs> I have to, you know, be on it every day or something like that. And, and to, to keep, you know, in communication, I guess. I mean, I, I have an objective for these things I want to get from it. But I, at the other hand, I also often think, well, shit, I wish I could just get off grid and not just forget about all this, you know. It's it's hard when you're in the business of promoting yourself and not being involved in something like social media because everyone's attention span is so short. You have to like constantly be throwing what you're doing out there for any of it to click. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Oh well, let me take a picture of us then. You, we can we can do that <laughs> we'll and let's do, post it. Yeah, we'll do that after. And like, hashtags and <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what that but is. But it's been proven that the. Like if someone likes a post that you put on social media, there's like a, an actual dopamine spike in your brain, and people yeah. people are becoming addicted to that because what they're doing is they're, they're well, we all like being liked, right? Exactly, but it's actually it's neuroscience. Yeah. There's an actual dopamine spike, so people are getting addicted to that feeling, uh, and that validation, mm -hmm. and they're getting so used to it that every day. Like, what am I going to post that's going to get the most likes? What am I going to share that's going to get the most likes? And, and I've, you know, I've, and I have. Conversely, if you don't get liked, you get depressed. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's a real thing. Yeah. And, and it's, it just feeds on people's insecurities. Like we're all, so many people require that outside validation in order to feel good about themselves. It just feeds on that. So it's like, all right, well, I, 
I need that outside validation every day. I'm going to post a selfie every day. I, I want someone to tell me that I'm cute every day or yada, yada. And, and it just, like, I remember when I was the, when I was out here in 2017 and I was living out here, I was, I was like, my dad had just died in 2016. I was in a really low spot and I was like looking through my history on social media and I was posting like multiple times a day. Cause I was just, I was like somebody like validation. I need to be loved. Like, cause I wasn't, feeling loved where I was and I wasn't loving myself. Mm -hmm. So it was like, it was really gross. And looking at it now is like cringy. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy. So yeah, just be careful. But you, you get a lot of real world validation doing what you do. Like you, you look out in front of audiences that are all singing words to your songs. Yeah. But even that is kind of funny. Here, hold them, hold oh, them. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Even that is, <laughs> it, it, is, you know, ephemeral in a way because you, you do a show and you're, you're you know, in that moment when you know everybody is like on some kind of high together reaching some euphoria and then it mm -hmm. all goes away again and you i've had a conversation with a couple of friends before about how that affects you not that it affects me deeply but i'm aware of the effect that that can have on an individual when you're feted and lauded and appreciated and loved and then you go home and you're alone i mean it's the same high yeah. and low you know yeah you go back to a regular yeah life right. yeah, yeah i mean and i'm sure like after if your regular life is doing podcasts in the back of a van then it's a bit of a this is my new life <laughs> i don't even know what my regular life is i have to, like in the first episode I, i'm 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 talking about like like i came out west to do music yeah and there were a lot of opportunities that were promised to me and like I would say like maybe like one out of six of them kind of right some keep, some bands said hey come out and open for us and not that, bands. that never happened not bands just pe people in the industry we we opened for you guys uh, oh okay i was just you know, that was i just want some validation that was all no that was great <laughs> yeah no that was great that was in 20 yeah that was in yeah. 2017 my life was shit yeah. and uh that was like the one of the highlights of that year for me so th yeah thanks for that but but moving out here it was a lot of uh, in industry Type oh, it's, a, it's promises. It's a tough town, boy. It is. Yeah, yeah. but but I'm I, I'm basically at the point where I'm like, okay, like I, I'll always have my band, but what like what else can I do with my time that I could? I'm just want to try some new things. Yeah. Well, see, so, that's uh, I mean, that's that's a positive thing from social media and all that is that it opens it up for anybody, in idiots like us, to do anything. You know, we yeah. can have podcasts, we can have blogs, we can have websites and Instagrams and Facebooks and all that kind of stuff. You know. Yeah. I mean, it just just be, but you know, more doesn't mean better. Right. But at least it's it's the opportunity for people, and and the good people will always rise to the top. You know. Well, you uh, hope. Yeah, like fingers like crossed. You, yeah. Fingers crossed. We'll see. Yeah, but I mean, you're just a, you're a good guy anyway. You know, just uh, so you have you have a that's what people, a good start. That's I what think. people you tell know, me. Yeah, maybe uh, that's what people tell me. Yeah. But but it's weird. Like I don't know. You can get down on yourself, and uh, like yeah. I'm 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 guilty of that because you you can be told that your band is good, or you could be told that you're a good guy or whatever. But like when you don't see the results and you're struggling, yeah. you 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 can internalize that and be like, hey, it's my fault that yeah, shit I, didn't work out the way I wanted it to. Yeah, but, but how, what it depends on what you think results are. I mean, is it financial success? Is it you know being on TV? Is it selling records, playing big shows? I, mean, yeah, I just yeah. want to not work a day job. That's it. Well, you can do that. You'll die, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to like. I I would like for something, one of my creator creative endeavors and yeah. or and or passions to right. to become something that can meet my bottom line of that's, wanting that, to eat. That's all I want. That's I the mean, dream. I, that's know, the dream. You know, the, the addicts. You may think. Um, do, do better than we actually do. We don't really make a lot of money. I barely make the rent and, you know, I have child support to pay and stuff like that. So it's a struggle for me month to month, you know. Yeah. But, but yeah. we get to do what we love. And so there's a balance there, you know. It's not Absolutely. And, but it would be nice to have something happen. Though, so you just had a check that came in and took care of that stuff. Absolutely. You know? Not not massive riches or anything like that. No, just fuck a no. Bit, a little bit just to be, you know. A little more comfortable. 
I just want to uh, start my candle making business. I'll buy some. I like candles. I do. That's that's uh, well. Our producer, my producer, is my partner, Allie. She's holding the camera, so she wants to make candles and have bunnies. So that's the dream. That's her dream. What's is it your dream too? What's her dream? Is your dream now? Uh, Supporting the dream. You not. know, I'm confused as to what my dream is because my dream was always to like just play the music and have people enjoy it enough for me to like survive yeah and i did that for a number of years but then i came out here and the the whole game changed because of the cost of living in california is like right compared to where i was living in michigan i could get by on very little out here it's a little different it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a lot different so i'm just i'm in that between phase where i'm adapting from being a midwest guy to trying to assimilate myself into this whole west coast thing which is expensive yeah and i don't have I don't have, there's not as many channels or, or I don't have as many contacts out here that, you know, I, when you're somewhere for 15, 20 years doing something, you know, all the people right. at all the clubs and I, out here, I'm just the new guy. So it's only been a couple of years. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, that's, I, and so I'm going to try a podcast and I'm going to still do the band thing. And I don't know what else I'm going to do. Start a candle business. There's a lot of competition in the candle business though. So it's, it's more brutal than music. I, I hear. Are there's, you being serious? Oh yeah. <laughs> there's lots of bastards in the candle business. There's a lot of yeah. We yeah. don't believe anything they say. They promise you the world, and then she started an Etsy, and there's actually like a a bunch of people like really killing it on there. So, <laughs> right. yeah, the internet, they're everywhere. There's candle makers and bunny okay. yeah. owners, bunny you know, <laughs> bunny breeders. Are you gonna breed? You... Well, that's pretty easy to beat breed rabbits. I think you just get two and one of each, and then you know off you go. I think they just do their thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you're in the UK and you're going from job to job, and you're not liking any of it. When did, when did music, when did your kind of focus shift, or did, did it happen on accident, or were were you always passionate about music? Like, how did I, I, no, I was just a fan. I mean, the band thing was just happenstance, really. I liked well i think i don't know maybe as a, as as you grow up you go through different styles of music that you like or what's fashionable particularly in the uk it's very like you know on trend um but what were you like obsessed with back then what or... i wasn't i don't remember being obsessed with anything i was kind of a uh introverted kid okay um Music I liked was whatever I was fed from, you know, Top of the Pops or Radio 1. You know, I didn't really explore beyond that. I didn't know that there was some kind of, you know, there was anything like underground or alternative back then. So it was just glam rock and pop music in the you know, early, mid-70s. What's some of the bands that would be? Uh, Slade, I'm... Sweet, T-Rex, Roxy Music. Hell yeah. We're going back into one of those interviews now. That's where I repeat all the things I've said before. Oh, uh, okay. So, well, we don't yeah. have to. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to do that. If, but, if, you know, but, uh, if it gets there, let me know. We, well, yeah, we, then, we can talk about bunnies. We can talk about whatever. I, uh, we had a couple of bunnies at home. But, uh, but I'm, but but I, but I'm I mean, interested in the trajectory of how does... How I does, was a kid that liked music, but I never had any as, aspiration or, or, or ambition or any talent for that matter to think that I could be in a band. So it was never even a thought of a reality. I mean, as I remember, I've still got some pictures I drew somewhere about oh, this would be what would I'd be like if I was in a band and I think I drew kind of pictures like, you know, Roy Wood and Wizard. Yeah. I think I was, I've got some pictures of me, you know, kind of, you know, Roy Wood Wizard kind of, green hair and face makeup kind of idea ah this would be the band i was in if i was in a band but again nothing more than like a, some kind of boyhood fantasy so and i like that stuff and then i went into listening to more rock music for a while but that was more because i had a bunch of friends that liked that so you know hang out with them you listen to what they like and that was black sabbath the purple uriah heap Wishbone Ash, I used to like for some reason. Nazareth was another band I was a big fan of. 
So you kind of just absorb what was around you. Yeah. And then I moved into um, hanging out with a lot of black friends. So then I was into soul music for a while. I was just a bit, I, you know, I just flit around between different groups. And so, so I was into James Brown and that kind of stuff. And we used to go and dance and get down. Good. <laughs> there, and then it tried to win it then more. Excuse me. Uh, then more of the, the Bowie, Roxy music stuff, that mid 70s Bowie. Thin White Duke was always one of my favorite eras of, of Bowie. So I really like, I kind of like that style. And then, like I said, Roxy Music, Bebop Deluxe, Cockney Rebel, those kind of bands. And they kind of transitioned over into punk, really. Um, so just an eclectic taste, just a kind of a fan, yeah, but a no, fan of all types of No, No things. real passion, no real drive to want to um, be in a band or anything like that. And that just that just happened by, you know, sheer chance, really. So Was it... Were the guys in, who you started the band with, were they in school with you? or was No, I didn't know any of them before, you know, 1976 or wherever it was. We're a little bit unclear of when exactly we met. but um, No, I didn't know Pete and Kid or Mel at all until we had uh, we came together, really just through a mutual acquaintance. It just said, you know. These guys like punk rock. Maybe you should too, because you know there weren't many people around, so we just huddled together. Just so, so it happens that they were, they had a band too. So. And what was their band called? Uh they hadn't actually played any shows. They had some working title, The Dumb, I think. So the, did you guys come together? The first show was all three of you. That's a question. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm um, interested. That's why I'm yeah, asking. I know, but it's not nothing. Uh, yeah, we rehearsed for a bit, and then you know, as those the four of us rehearsed it in their house, and then uh, I think we played a couple of show, a few shows without a bass player. We just had two guitarists, and then eventually a bass player joined, and you know, fifteen or sixteen bass players later. We're still going. Did you guys incorporate any of the theatrics in the, from the very beginning, or was that something that kind of was a slow burn? Not, not the, not the way that you would see it now. We were always like dynamic and jumping around, and you know, I would climb on things and goof off and stuff like that. We were, we always had a sense of humor from the beginning. Yeah, but that you know that. What it is now, you know, it's just it was something that came later. What what year did you actually move out to the States? I came here in 1993. Okay, so you had been, the band had been touring the States probably previously for a number of years. Yeah, later. Well, we came in 83 and 84. And then we came again, I think, in 86 or 7, something like that. But I, from as I recall, it was always West Coast. I don't think we ever got further than, I think we uh, went to Phoenix or somewhere like that. But um, we never did New York or anywhere, any of those places in Midwest, East Coast until much later, I think. Um, so, yeah, I came in 80, 83 and through the 80s and... What were your thoughts when you first came to California? Oh, we were well impressed because, you know, we arrived at LAX and we got picked up in a limo that was sent to us by Golden Voice and all this kind of stuff. So we thought it was all pretty fancy stuff. So when you first landed here? Yeah. Limo at LAX? Yeah. Okay. Never had one since. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but still, that's, that's a... Yeah, it left that, an impression, you know. Yeah, that's got to be a crazy first impression. Like, was yeah. that the... So the first time you ever came to America was yeah. Limo Oh, yeah. wow. So what... How did, what, what did that feel like? Uh, it's, it's incredible. We, and again, just the... The noise, the, 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 the smells, all of the senses, you know. Every, you know just, 
Well, it just just feels different, smells different, looks different. You know, even like the the air is different. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just everything was alien to us, and because we'd been to, uh, we'd been we'd started going to Europe in the early eighties, I think. But I'd never been before the band. I'd never been out of England, you know. So, I mean, it, so every place uh, you went, it was new. Yeah, when you, when you went there, right? And uh. Yeah, it was some great experiences, but I, but then I think you're, you know, just too not to be down on the young people of today, but sometimes you're not even aware of what's going on. You don't stop and you know absorb what's around you. Maybe culturally, you're just there to, to party. For yeah, for many many years, yeah. yeah, that's where I was at. Yeah, I was too blacked out to notice what was going on yeah so but i just mostly toured the states like right. i haven't the most of the world traveling i've done was but like by accident you I, got on the wrong plane or no i uh i got an <laughs> acting gig so i went to spain and do oh, tell us about that neil <laughs> i was high uh so in american high schools they show videos for the foreign language class mm. and they're usually like they have a low production value they're not real actors right and so i got hired to be one of those not real actors and go to spain and get paid a little bit of money and eat a bunch of ham so i said yeah <laughs> so so i somewhere out there i'm in a video where i'm speaking spanish poorly um i had a i had an interpreter that was helping me say my lines right. but but yeah i was i was paid to act in a high school level Spanish educational video. Do you remember your lines? Um, <laughs> El Mando de la Televisión is uh, a remote control. I think that's one of the only ones I remember. Can we uh, produce it? Can we find that clip and drop it into this? Uh, I, I have to hit up Al and, and see yeah. if that clip actually exists. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure like it would be laughable to see it. <laughs> I'm laughing already. But it, uh, yeah. That was that was 2011. I was already I was already sober. Oh, so. not so long ago. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't I didn't I had already like quit alcohol. So I didn't really. It wasn't me like <clears throat> wiling out. I I was pretty yeah. well behaved, and and especially anything they filmed of me was me trying to do a good job for them. So I don't know. It's it's I don't know if it's good. I've never seen it. Well, what about your the rest of your acting career then? It doesn't exist. If that was it. Well, I was uh, I was in a high school play. I, I, I was in a, a production of Fiddler on the Roof where I played the beggar. I had two speaking lines. They were um, one kopeck. Last week you gave me three kopecks. Because yeah, I'm complaining. Again, one kopeck. Last week you gave me three kopecks. That's a little I, accent. There. I don't know. Yeah. I, I was yeah. I was a sophomore in high school. <laughs> I don't. I don't think the mics are gonna pick up your coughing. Huh. She's sick too. I woke up like that this morning, actually. Everyone's sick. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it as far as my my acting career is concerned. Mm. I mean, if you if you don't count like getting up on stage and acting like me on steroids or whatever. Like, yeah. Like, I mean, I. When you're up on stage, you're acting. Like I, that's the way I I look at it. Like people are like, you said this, you said that. It's like no, that that isn't really me. This is kind of a, a, a amped up version. It's a of persona me. that you yeah exactly adopt. I think yeah. I, I just um, well, everybody does them. Whether you wear flamboyant costumes or makeup, or you just go up there and a dirty t shirt, you're all you become another version of yourself i think absolutely you know, stage. well and that's what they're saying too about the social media back to the mm. whole instagram thing is is people are putting out what they want people to think those people are you know what i'm saying like i like i'm only gonna say what i i'm oh, yeah, I, I mean, it, acting to act in a way where you're like this is who this person is when in fact i, I may be the complete opposite uh i have i have this one friend that's always posting really optimistic stuff yeah Opti- all this optimism and he he's a he's a really depressed alcoholic <laughs> right you know and so and i know from from spending a lot of time with this guy that like all of that 
all of the, what he's putting on social media, he doesn't abide by that. I mean, it's it's wishful thinking. Maybe it helps him through his depression. Right. But you get this sense, like, this guy is this positive guy. No, not really. He's kind of... And, and same same thing with me. Like, like people get this impression of, like, who I am because in front of a microphone. It's mm. like, when behind that, I'm actually, like, kind of timid. Yeah. Very anxious. And I have, like, low self-esteem. You know? Like, I'm... It's uh No, oh, I understand yeah. that. I was never a, a, a confident Well yeah, you said kid, you were you, you said know? you're a quiet kid. Yeah. Like kind of introverted. Yeah, kind of socially kind of awkward and not uh able to I mean strike up a conversation and that's where I kind of fell into alcohol really because it just helped me through that, you know, social awkwardness. It it lubricated all of that anxiety for me. Yeah. Uh, and and to me, I was like, okay, I can I can have a few drinks and become that confident, talkative, loud, sure of himself person right. that I I knew in my core I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where I would use it as a tool, but then it got to the point where I was it was killing me, like. like when it's a when it's not fun anymore and two when it's getting to the point where you can't even be that confident person because you're slurring your speech right then you like, have a completely false impression of yourself anyway oh i was a big dumb idiot <laughs> i was like i was like wrestling people at bars the strangers getting kicked out of bars falling down stairs like uh, injuring myself i tore my acl when i was blacked mm -hmm. out driving i would get behind the wheel of a car i don't know do you do you feel comfortable at all elaborating on, on your bout with alcohol? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I, 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 and it goes back to going to the, you know, going to the pub at 15 because it was easy to get served and, yeah. you know, helping with uh, self confidence and stuff like that. And after a while, it, it, oh, it you'd seem to be drinking not because of any of that stuff, just, be, just because you have to, really. Yep. You know. And then the, the, I think the drink, I, and same with any other addiction, it, it takes over and you you just become a vessel for the drug. You know. And, um, yeah, I was. Because how long have you been sober from uh, it's alcohol? About, it's about six years now. Okay. So, um, yeah. And, and that was, I just got to the point where, I, guess, I mean, I was married at the time and I'm now which is a big you know significant factor in you know that situation and um yeah i was just a bit of a jerk really i mean I, you know you just get to be self self-absorbed and it gets to be about you and the alcohol and nothing else really did it get to the point where you felt like you lost control i wasn't ever totally out of control i don't think but i could they were i knew that i would be if the things carried on much so you feel much like longer you know i got to the point where i, I mean this is just i don't know just waking up and drinking vodka is not good you know <laughs> <laughs> well i remember what would happen with me is like i would black out and then when i came to i would still be drunk but when the alcohol wore off the the anxiety would set in yeah and uh and pretty much i would be so anxious that i'd have to drink more in order to get rid of the anxiety and it was kind of a it was kind of a vicious cycle. I didn't drink every day, but I would drink for four or five days in a row. Yeah. And and having to stay drunk. And and then when I finally stopped drinking, I would have like a really bad, anxious, super anxious day where I thought I like needed to go to the hospital. I was like two hundred and fifty pounds. I was like mm. bigger than I am now. Like So yeah. was I. And uh Yeah. Was there did you do any like program or anything to stop or did you just like have the wherewithal to just be like i don't want to live this way anymore? i no, i didn't go well i went to a couple of meetings but i thought that would and it just wasn't for me but mm -hmm. what that was was a catalyst because i think when you finally get to the point where it's like, i gotta stop drinking what am i gonna do i'm gonna go to aa because that's what people do mm -hmm. so okay i go to aa and it wasn't for me it's not for everybody. But it got me on the steps to saying, okay, well, at least I'm doing something about it now. You know? And then... Um, the best part... When I, I, then I just I just 
just took care of it myself really i don't you know yeah the, the when i went to aa i didn't go in the beginning i just kind of stopped i just i'm like this is going to kill me my yeah. my doctor said my blood pressure like my my weight and my blood pressure were all really high mm. and it was dangerous and uh but when i went to aa which was like years after i quit drinking i just i felt kind of the th- the hearing the stories of the other people in the meetings that's what i really identified with not necessarily the the way they deal with sobriety right um but just hearing hearing everyone everyone kind of had a rock bottom and everyone was kind of saying the same things that i had gone through so i, I really identified with right but i could never get beyond that that final step really as or, yeah you know whatever that was step you know giving it all up to god you know, yeah. whatever your God may be, but there has to be some God, some great. Yeah, the, uh, I, the higher power thing. That yeah, yeah, it's a, it's hard for a lot of people to right. get behind that. Right. Well, my friend that was going, she she said, "Well, my higher higher power is myself." Like she kind of twisted it, yeah. so it didn't make it about God. It made it be more internalized. Well, yeah, I mean, they do say it doesn't have to be God in traditional sense. You make it whatever it, it is, but. Um, the majority of people will say, "Oh, and again, it's all in the book." Yeah, you know, and it's like it's the Bible. It's a little rigid. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. like it's definitely seems culty. But it, I mean, it helps plenty of people. I mean, it keeps them keeps them out of the bars. So you know, well, that's the thing. It, in six meetings a day. But. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some people do a morning meeting and then they have a, a night meeting. But if but that's the thing is like like you were saying earlier about religion. It's like if it helps some people, I'm not gonna. Like there's, I'm not gonna knock it. I'm not gonna. You can't purport to be like a, a open-minded and uh, you know, like a free thinker and an understanding individual if you're gonna be down on other people who think that they think the same. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so. I figure if just people are, are trying to do what they can do to have a happy life. Well, fuck, it's not easy, is it? You know. No. When I was a little kid, it was really easy. I just had my video games and uh, my comic books. Why don't, how about this? That when 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 the the uh, the devices take over and they rule the world, human beings, we only have to be, we only have to live till we're like fourteen or something like that. But each year, so about those fourteen years are elongated. So it's really so one year would be like five years. So a fifty. So you live to be seventy, but you live you get to be one year old for five years, and then you then you get two for five years. So you're you're a child for all of your life, basically. So you just live to be, or you can just choose the age. You can be seven forever. They would like to be seven for seventy years. That's a tough question. I wouldn't mind being ten. Ten. You'd be ten. Yeah, ten. Because you're 10, you're having fun, you're kind of you're able to run yeah, around a little just, bit of freedom, I, you haven't got sex to worry about yet. Yeah, yeah you know, I wasn't really concerned yeah. about the opposite sex, I just yeah. was listening to my tapes right. and reading my comic books and riding around on my bike and hanging out with my friends and playing the Nintendo and I was, yeah, I was a pretty happy little kid at 10. 10? Yeah, yeah, around third grade. Age. Yeah. It, um, oh, you don't have to go to school either, you know. To be 10 for 70 years. <laughs> It would get boring. Anything, you need change. Well, you're 10, you don't know. You just wake up every day, hey, I'm 10. Well, you don't have a concept that you're going to be 10 forever. If you, were, like 10. if you were oblivious, you know, and if you if you had, if you you didn't know that you, <laughs> things would change, you'd grow up, you'd, because that, that's the thing is even when you're 10, you're you're looking at the future. You're like, oh, I can't wait till I'm 12. I can't wait till I'm right. eight, 18 and I can buy cigarettes. Like, I don't know. Oh, then you have to go into some office and they say, Neil, you're not ever going to be 11. You're going to be 10 forever. And then you'd be depressed for the next 60 years because you're 10 forever. Yeah, that's... All right, no, I don't know if this is going to work. So do you think Do you think that this is what's going to be implemented when the machines take over? We're going to all live happily? I don't know. Uh, when you first were talking about it, you, you one to fourteen, and then you're just gone. I'm, I, just, like, I, I'm just bouncing around ideas, but you could well. That would be kind of cool, actually, to just like one to fourteen, but every one of those years would be five years, like what you were saying. Yeah, but you wouldn't want to be one year old for five years. Yeah, it's interesting. 
I'm my brain is actually quite engaged right now. I'm thinking about all types of stuff. I'm thinking. Well, about yeah. I mean, time is you know, it's, it's, but there's something to be said about getting older and getting wiser too, because I think shit doesn't matter so much. You know, how old are you? Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. So I'm yeah. gonna be I'm gonna be sixty next month. And so the things that I used to care about, I don't care about anymore. You know. Stress and the smaller things in life, and you know. Um, so if he's going to stay ten forever, then I think you you might miss out on some of the benefits of the age and experience brings. But you'll be eternally happy. So I feel like when you're ten, depending on what your living situation is, you don't have a whole lot of worry. I've, I've, Not right. Well, I felt most of the worries. Well, in, this is from our perspective. You know, yeah. the, the, you know, d despite how tough it is here, we're privileged as far as the rest of the world goes. Right? Oh, absolutely. You know, so there's plenty of ten year olds that are struggling to find something to eat right now. So, well, that's what I was yeah, saying. That's yeah. what I was saying. Depending on the situation, yeah. you're absolutely right about that. When I was ten, nineteen sixty nine, I was ten. So you know, was that Woodstock was just about to happen or something? <laughs> The Beatles had split up, but the, the Stones were still going. Uh, uh, it was like the whole... But I wasn't really... When I was 10, I wasn't really aware of music. I, I was reading, because that's all you really had to do. I'm playing football, soccer. I, I ride my bike, play soccer, read my comics. I can't think of anything. And run around in the woods and climb trees and stuff like that. I can't think of anything else that I really needed to do. It sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I was 10 in, in 1989, and I just, yeah, the movie Batman came out that summer on, on June 23rd, 1989. The Tim Burton Batman with yeah. Jack Nicholson. And I saw that movie with my my dad. Um, We had a choice to either see Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or Batman with Michael Keaton. And I'm like, let's go see Batman. I didn't know anything about comic books, so that 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 summer changed my life. I got really, I just started drawing a lot. Mm. Like I went to, um, yeah, eventually like went to art school and stuff. Like right out of, out of high school because I was, I draw a lot of cartoons and right. stuff. But the the music kind of took over. Kind of stopped drawing as much. Mm -hmm. I went to art school, kind of got a bad taste in my mouth. It's like when you're forced to do something that you enjoy doing and it becomes like <clears throat> your focus. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the same thing happens, you know, like we being in a band and stuff, you, you get to the point where you do it so much where sometimes you not like you have to force it, but you have to just, you have to remind yourself that it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, this is a cool thing that I get to do. Right. Cause it's a lot of work. Yeah, I think it's yeah. And if you're in your own band, then it's not so not so difficult to enjoy it. But I mean, I I met other musicians that are like session musicians, or maybe like they play in an orchestra or something like that, and yeah. they're just there, basically just you know going through the motions and stuff like that. They have no control or no no input or anything like that. You just have to do exactly what you're told it's a tough pill to swallow and, and it's it, it's hard to imagine that music and you know creativity should, should could be like that that it could be stifling and and not interesting to anybody you know if i feel like because it's it's a business yeah i feel like that's where a lot of that comes from because i mean the we know, we know guys that are in like tribute bands to bands they don't even like, but they're trying to pay their rent. Yeah, yeah, that's it's kind of a bummer. Yeah, or uh, you know, playing music they're not really passionate about that they didn't write because they just need a gig. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of that out here. Yeah. So, yeah, to be excited night after night is to have your own thing. Yeah. Absolutely. It doesn't. The travel and everything doesn't ever wear on you. Oh, yeah, it gets you down, of course. Yeah, um, I mean, down, not depressing, but just it just wears on you because just physically, I mean, it just yeah. you know, saps all the energy out of you, and there's all the, and it's you know, there's an element of stress that goes with that too, because you know, 
as, as rock and roll as we think we are, we still have to be somewhere at a certain time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a van breaks down or you miss a flight or, you know, there's a delay or something like that, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's there are all those factors to consider. But, uh, I mean, we just had a tour of, um, you know, South America when lots of things went wrong, you know, in, in like logistics and production and stuff like that. And, um, so it's tough from that perspective, but as soon as you step on the stage, that, that all goes away. You know? Yeah, because that's the pinnacle of right. why you're doing right. all of the stressful okay. stuff. We made it. Here we go. Yeah. Bang! First note, lights come up, and you you forget all the all the shit you've been through for the rest of the day. You know, you might have to go back to it after <laughs> fix it after the show. Yeah, but yeah. While you're out on the stage, then you know, nothing nothing really matters. You know, you're kind of untouchable in a way. I gotta keep that in mind. That's. Yeah, because a lot of times I'll like like we'll be traveling or we'll be on tour or whatever, and I'll I'll bring some of that stress like onto the stage with me, like in the back of my head, like it's lingering back there. Yeah, but maybe I mean that might work for you though. Maybe that's I mean, do you feel that you perform better when you take the stress with you? Or? When I was in New York City, I got a ticket for a, taking a right on a red light. It was a three hundred dollar ticket, uh -huh. and I I made I was. I made it like the focal point of my banter yeah. about the New York City traffic laws that I was unaware of because there's no signs or anything. Right. So I guess sometimes bringing it with you like can be a device to connect with locals. Right. You know, kind of like a stand-up comedian would be like, "Hey, you know, I'm in New Jersey." Yeah. And um so I yeah, I guess. But but the bullshit that doesn't really matter like to leave that behind. Yeah. Or any animosity with the the guys in the group or any, anything like that like it'd be nice yeah because once you're on the stage then it's, it's about you and the audience mm. they, don't, they don't give a fuck what you've been through to get there exactly you know, they don't know they don't care they just want to see the show they paid for right yeah. i gotta think about that more <laughs> yeah my brain is going boop, 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 boop. Boop, 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 boop. so when did you decide I'm going to live in California. Like you, you guys got here in, in, in the eighties and that limo came and picked you up. But when, when were you like, we're going there? Was that a collective decision by you and the guys? I actually no, because, um, it was the end of, was it the late eighties? We came out again and I met what would be my future wife here in LA. She's from uh, Illinois originally, but she was... Okay, Midwest. Yeah, Midwest girl. So she was out here, we met, and then I... We met in the 80s, we had this uh, long story, and then we lost touch, reconnected in 90s, 93 or something like that. So I came out then in 93. Pete had already moved out about a year before, so he was here. And then I came out. So it's just us two <clears throat> that came to California. And we just came because, of, you know, we just wanted a better lifestyle. It wasn't really about the band. I mean, the band had brought us here and we met people. So, you know, it facilitated that. But we didn't come because, oh, we need to base the band in California so we can make it or anything. It was more personal decisions that brought us out here. <clears throat> so as Pete and myself have already been, have been California-based, you know, 25 years now. And, kid the drummer's still in england and now in the band we have two germans and they're based in berlin so you know we just uh, all migrate together you know as necessary that's pretty cool that you guys could all be located in such different places and still make it work but it was already working to the point where you could just come out here because you wanted to be here personally and the, the band would still function um yeah well actually in we came out in 93. I came in 93. We did a tour in 94, which was uh, pretty horrible as far as I'm concerned. We were in that 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 space when we kind of dropped off the radar a little bit. So we did this tour in 94, and it didn't really it didn't go well. We did like six weeks on the road uh, all across the U.S., all kinds of places that 
Yeah, that's we, a- we had no business playing in really. <laughs> um, but and then we came back. I think I made like a thousand bucks or something like that for a six week tour or something. You know. Yeah. Uh, and sounds about right. Uh, yeah. And then <clears throat> uh, we didn't we didn't play for a few years after that. We kind of just drifted off and did our own thing. And I moved up to San Francisco. I started working more in. Uh, like a full-time archaeology job up there. Pete was down in California. He was coaching uh, soccer full-time at a pretty high level. Kid was back in England. And Was there ever a collective decision to, like, disband? There was never, like, a, okay, we're done, we split. We just, it just, it just said, okay, well, it, we just kind of all drifted off and did our own thing and waited for the right time to come around and, you know, what Which was, it did. It may, it may, it, you know, well, I mean, it did, but yeah, absolutely you know, possible that it wouldn't have done, but you know, I don't. What was your mindset when during that, the downtime from the band? Were you just. I was kind of nice to be away from it, really, in, yeah. a, in a way that it, because I had a solid job um, with a good income. I was married to a beautiful woman. We had a nice time in, in, san francisco we didn't have kids you know we were doing, it was a good time so i didn't really worry too much about the band or have miss it then but um by the time it came around again i you were ready to you know go back to it that's kind of cool that there wasn't like a, a big melting down of the you know no, there was never any fight or any breakup or yeah. anything like that it was just a, a slow kind of you know, dissipation because just, just all went there did and, your separate things yeah and that uh, and i think that i think that was good because if we'd have kept on pushing through after such a shitty tour it probably would have just got worse you know that's interesting <laughs> make sure that camera's working <laughs> Well, my, I, my brain is definitely engaged. I'm thinking about lots of things. I'm thinking about ways that I, w- I want to have a better mindset. And I'm also thinking about maybe calming down a little bit because at this point in my life, there might be a, a little... I was like really rigidly touring, doing like over 100 shows a year. Uh-huh. And like that was my focus is I'm like, I got to make this band work. I got to make this band work. I got to make... And when I moved out here and after my dad died and I had to get a hernia surgery and all the stupid stuff happened, like the band didn't work the way I wanted it to. And I'm at this point right now where I'm 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 working. I have a, a nice, beautiful partner in my life. I mean, I'm in a, a a beautiful place. I'm in a good situation, but I'm beating myself up because, like, mentally, because things didn't go the way I wanted them to. So, to to hear that there was like maybe a, you, maybe the th- the way that you wanted them to be were not was not the the way they was best for you anyway. I mean. Maybe what what you were aiming for was the wrong thing, or in your mind you had an idea, and maybe this is the right thing. And, mm. I have no idea. No, me neither. I'm just yeah, but we're gonna. But that, all philosophical. But I think, but I think it's inspiring for me to sit next to you and hear about you you guys having a lull in the band thing, but you were content. Yeah. At, at that time, and to, like that's inspiring to me because it's like. If I'm not playing 100 shows a year, does that mean my life has to be shit? Does that mean I have to beat myself up? Like, like I, I kind of got obsessed with the idea of turning my little thing that started in a basement into something bigger. Right. And I, and I thought I could will it, you know? <clears throat> but so much of it has to do with whether or not the public's ready to embrace it. Yeah. You can try really hard at something, but maybe... maybe You've got to have something else. It can't all be the, the band. You have to have something else. I mean, like that, not just you, but everybody. Yeah. You know. No, but that, because that's... it's such a hard thing to be in, and, and f- so few people really make it. That if you just you know throw your life into it, then you know it will it will fucking it will fuck you up. You what know? do you enjoy most when you're not being on stage, like? It's very simple things, really. You still doing yoga? I do yoga. I probably will go to yoga after this. Yeah. Is, it, is it hot yoga? Yeah. She doesn't like hot yoga. Is it just the hot part you don't like? Oh, okay. Well, then it's yoga. Cold yoga. She likes yoga. <laughs> yeah. Her body doesn't sweat. Oh. Well. So she overheats. 
Okay. Like she she'll go into a sauna and have to leave because she'll like feel like she's gonna pass out. She like doesn't you don't sweat that much. Are you okay? Huh. Uh yeah, I enjoy that. I mean that's about the extent of my I used to be more of a runner and a, a workout kind of guy, but I'm kinda I enjoy the yoga and um it seems to, you know, keep me in shape. I don't really need anything else. Uh, so I like that. I mean, I like just pottering. I mean, you, you know, step outside this van, ladies and gentlemen. And there's a Goodwill store just around the corner, so you'll find me there soon. I like. I want to go thrift stores and antiques and you know flea markets and that kind of stuff. And I like, uh, and I like going to shows too. I still go to uh, quite a few shows you know yeah so you're doing some uh guest vocals it... did some guest vocals at a place down at in the is it tarzana Tar- yeah i mean it's like 20 minutes from here but it's my it's yeah we've played there. as local as the my die bar goes and just jumping up with friends and I, and I like the idea that i can just get on stage and sing and it doesn't have to all that paraphernalia it doesn't you know i don't have to dress up and prepare and yeah, travel and you know, just just sing for singing's sake. Yeah, just go I down. Mean, the... And I know I'm not the best singer, but I enjoy it anyway. Yeah. And get away with it. And so I'm also looking at you know maybe doing some some other things like that, some side projects and stuff like that, that I can do locally. Um, because the you know it's it's not so you know the addicts take some work to get it all together. I mean it's well it's worth it because it's it's amazing when it all comes together. But you know it's nice to be able to. You know, collaborate with some different people and you know, try some new experiences. Really challenge yourself. You know, step outside your comfort zone. Yeah. That's what I said in the first episode. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm learning that now because I what I found is like being obsessed with one thing. It's like either this happens or nothing happens. I found I just was really unhappy because. It wasn't happening the way I wanted it to. So, yeah, you got to have something else. I, yeah. I need to just keep telling myself that. Right. I mean, and, you know, it could be something else outside of music or other musical projects that are different with different people. And, you know. And you start that polka band. Polka? Yeah, that polka band I always wanted to start. She's, yeah? No, I'm just bullshitting. See, you might have had a good idea then. You, you just, you've just... Uh, dismissed it just thrown it away but that might be no i have ideas it's just not polka like okay mariachi. i do like but yeah i just probably yeah i'm inspired right now i'm I'm really glad you came out here man yeah me too because yeah the, and, and that's the thing that what i talked about when i first started this i, I want to try something new i'm not i'm not a world-class interviewer i'm just a dude that has a couple microphones and a couple cameras this is totally at its very baby stages but but yeah, what, but it doesn't. I don't. Why is, what does it need to be more than this? It's just a couple of friends sitting around talking. I mean, as long as we, you know, the conversation is somewhat interesting to other people, then uh, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> might check in if it's just like and too drunk sitting in a bar just talking nonsense. You know, there's no, we're not going to work. But uh, yeah, either I think this will be. Is, I think this is engaging. Our people would. Well, we'll find out because I will post it on my social media channel. Wait, because he's got Insta. Yeah. I'm going to put that link up. Yeah. You're going to follow Monkey on Insta. Yeah. Yeah, when I saw that, you you gave us a follow, and I'm like, I'm like, huh, I'm like, I wonder if he actually, this is his Instagram. And I'm like, I think it is. Because you were posting like pictures of you when you were young. and Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like when you were a little kid. Well, I don't actually manage it. My dear friend Marlena is the one that put, you know. Ah, she. I mean, I send her the stuff, and she. Uh, I provide the content, and she doesn't edit or anything like that. She just puts it in the right place at the right time. Or do, do the notifications come to your phone though? Like when I you- have to turn them off. Not that I'm, you know, getting millions, but it was enough to be annoying already. Yeah. <laughs> Were they making noise on your phone? Uh, yeah, ping, 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 ping. There's a ping. I have de-pinged it. That's good. Yeah, I, my phone's always on silent, so even when people call me on the phone, I don't answer because oh, yeah. I can't hear it. Yeah. Well, cool. I'm gonna try to find some like yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna explore. And that's the thing is I could, I could be out here and I could be like Plan A didn't go the way I wanted it to, but right. there can be a million different plans. 
I mean, it's the land of what is this the land of? What is California the land of? Uh, the land of opportunity. Is that what they say, or is that America? Oh, uh, the land of the land of four dollar gas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it the Golden State or is it the sun, Sunshine State? I don't know. I know what There's a bear it? on the flag. I know that one. Golden State. That is it. You look nice right now, Allie. Thanks uh, for doing Yeah, this. thanks, Allie. And it's raining. You can hear the rain pitter pattering on the. Oh, there's rain on the van roof. Well, I, I, I guess we can wrap this up. We've been talking for how long? Do you guys want to get like maybe some like shots in front of the circus? Yeah. We could. Well, we need one in the van. Since this is where all the action took place. This is where all the action took place. So we're we're recording the podcast in the van and we are using our devices to get an image of us in the van. All right. What? Oh see. Is that what we're doing? What? No, this is this just happens, see, like I see this is what happens on the Instagram. I just got a a message to say that uh, the video that I shot for the single that I did with the Dickies is just about to be released. So, yeah. Amazing, isn't it? We're all connected. So you you do have a single with the Dickies that's out. Is that out now or is it? Yeah, it's just about to release it. Yeah, it's a cover of a, a cheap trick song called I Did Go Go Girls. It's okay. A very obscure B side. Um, it's a very obscure B side that they never really. Oh, actually, or uh, maybe just a session track or something. But we had to change the lyrics because it was very, uh, it was very racist, which was surpri- what? surprising from Cheap Trick. A Cheap Trick song. But it was all like tongue in cheek. It was all about a racist man. And look at me, I'm a fucking idiot. I'm a racist. But they it used racist terms. To yeah. Make that point. It's probably best just to avoid that. Yeah. Even Leonard didn't want to go there. Right. <laughs> he he's the guy that was. Uh, he doesn't mind controversy or controversy. Yeah, the whole warp tour thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's get. Uh... <laughs> I have a mustache. Oh, you do. You're a hipster. Yeah, look at me. I'm a hipster. <laughs> Well, so we're going to wrap this up. This has been episode three of Subcast with Neil P. Neil Patterson. And I'm sitting next to Monkey in the van. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. And uh, my people would need me. Yeah, he's being distracted by well, his device. Actually, the dog needs to go for a piss, but there you go. Yeah, that's important. The dog sends me messages now. He says it's remarkable, isn't it? For real? I don't know. Yeah, the dog's texting. It will soon. So, so we're here and. Check out that Dicky single. What's it called? Uh, something to do with girls going somewhere. Girls that go. Yeah, girls that go. By girls cheap trick. Go. Yeah. <laughs> and be go, sure. Go, to, go go girls. Be sure to follow Monkey on Insta. I'm gonna put the link down yeah, here somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and this is episode three. Uh, and the, and uh, don't forget the addicts will be touring uh, the USA in August and October probably. Uh, East coast, west coast, and somewhere in the middle. Yeah, so what's the website? What's the Addicts website? Uh, it's just the... Uh, just the Google ad- the Addicts. Ad, you know. A, yeah, w- yeah, the Addicts yeah, with one D. A-D-I-C-T-S. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll see this dude. So so farewell, Internet. Thank you, Internet. And when it all goes to shit, we will live 14 years. And that's it. 10 forever. 10 forever. I w- Batman forever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right now we're going to play the end of the interview that we didn't catch with the good audio, but so the, the audio is going to be a little crappy. But this is where Monkey goes into his archaeologist tale about the underground of Los Angeles and finding cadavers and, and skulls and whatnot. And it's kind of interesting. So listen to this little portion and then we'll take you home and that'll be the end. Or like you said, you stepped away and did like archaeology for a little while, or you were an archaeologist? I am an archaeologist, yeah. Yeah, that's really, that's like so cool to yeah, hear about. Yeah, why about that? You guys did, you guys, you guys touched, touched on, on it. Bit, yeah. yeah, that's so interesting. Did you go to school for that? <clears throat> no. I don't have a, I'm not an academic archaeologist, but I have, now I have to be.
years of experience. So huh. it's, it's, um, I, I, it's not something I've done much in the last few years, but I just finished a project in uh, downtown LA. I've been working down there since November. Wow, on and off. Uh, it was a really cool site. Is it like a dig? Yeah. Cool. That is cool. Did they find anything? He, like what? Those like, of human bones. Really? Yeah. Weird. And yeah, it was creepy. It wasn't just, and not just skeletons, like burials. It was, um, it was the site of a, a medical college. It was a, a USC's first school in LA in the 1880s. And so the students would practice on cadavers. Mm. And when they're done, they would, all these bones were just left in the ground, which we found. They were discovered in May of last year, and it took, it's taken a year to for that all to go through the process and for us to do the excavation and recover everything. But it was all, um, I got some pictures here somewhere. That's yeah. sick. So it was no whole skeletons, but it was just like the art, as a, like a the bottom half of a torso here and the top half there and some skulls here and hands there and just all wow. parts everywhere. So it, it's verifiable that it's all <clears throat> from the 1800s. The cadavers. Yeah, we had to get the coroner out and they look at it. We couldn't really identify. You can't really identify it. Yeah, because they, they were pretty deteriorated. No, oh, no, oh, actually, no. they were really good. So, and some of them were in such good condition. Whoa. Um, that's just a. Damn. It's a bunch of vertebrae. Spine and some legs and ribs Whoa. and stuff like That's that. Crazy. This is like a foot underneath the ground, <clears throat> right next to the 101 near Union Station. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's just one <clears throat> of like a dozen little areas like that. Uh, so insane. Just all the stuff that's been buried from the past that you can just, oh, there it is. Was it a rumor? Or was that true when they um, excavated the um, site of the Twin Towers that they found like pieces of a ship under there? Did you read about that? Uh, I don't know, but that might be true because <clears throat> I think that was like built. little dock area. Yeah, yeah. So, isn't that crazy? Wow. Yeah. Where's the buried treasure? <clears> hey. <throat> oh, so, so this is not the best best angle, but this is a skull. And that's the top of the skull because they would at the school they would slice off the top of the cranium so they could mm -hmm. examine the brain mm -hmm. basically one way they would the only way they could would figure out if you were insane or not is just take the brain out and see if it looked enlarged and if it wasn't oh he's not insane yeah <laughs> but there's a really cool that's weird <laughs> there was a really cool story i found because i have to do the research <laughs> as well mm -hmm. so now i have to do some research and um try and back up some of this stuff it's the same kind of thing. It's, that's like hips and stuff. Wow. That's really interesting. I found a really cool story about this this guy that murdered two other people. That you guys... With an axe. Uh-huh. Do you like my bikes? I found that too. Like it's a, a license plate from a 1915 motorbike. That's cool. Probably a Harley or an Indian, like a chief. That's like an totally Indian or a collector's piece. Yeah. To somebody. But I found this story about this guy who murdered two people with an axe and he went to prison and he pleaded insanity because mm -hmm. he fell off a horse and blah, blah, blah. And then somebody, this is all in the LA Times, if you're interested in reading the old newspapers, they're really fascinating, they're yeah. all available online. Mm -hmm. um, somebody stuck, uh, got strychnine into the prison, so he took the strychnine and committed suicide. And then they took his body to this place and they they cut the top of his skull off and examined his brains to see if he was the sick. college students. Yeah, yeah. So <clears> it's <throat> quite possible that one of these is that bodies guy? is, is that murder. Murder. That we'll never know for sure. But yeah. Is his brain but enlarged? Probably. Yeah, that's the question. Uh, well, we, we didn't find the brain. Oh, you're right. I'm just. Well, <laughs> what we did find is, and I've got some. Of <clears throat> there's um there's, there's this really cool um, structural remains there. There's all these old walls that are probably the earliest structures ever exposed in LA, mm -hmm. 1830s, mm -hmm. like a, a, a winery. So that's kind of actually more important than the bones are. Yeah, like the old. Very early LA history. Mm -hmm. 
Now, like in New York, I would see when I was walking around, you'd see the asphalt coming up and you could see like the old like cobblestone yeah, through the asphalt. It was really cool. That's right. Yeah. It's like old you. New York. I don't know. But we found this stuff called adipocea as well. It was attached to some of the bones. So when you're, when you're fat and your muscle starts to decompose, mm -hmm. it turns into the stuff. They also call it corpse wax morgue wax mm -hmm. they find it in the bodies in the morgue too so all this stuff comes turns to like a like candle wax mm -hmm. but it's white and so we found that still attached damn some of the bones it's crazy that it would preserve that long well that's 150 years or something like that. yeah that's cool yeah you're a cool hobby you gotta yeah it's like the thing on the side but you gotta love it you know yeah no this is it's, it's a pretty you know, it's a job it's yeah praise okay but you it's interesting like you're interested in it I think that, yeah some of it's not interesting some of it kind of gets very hmm. into management and administration and stuff like that and I don't know I don't like there's some aspects of the writing I like I like the research but I don't really like to like to write reports anymore mm -hmm. it's kind of dry that makes sense statistical yeah. So I've been very selective on what I do. So I did this project and I hadn't done anything for almost two years before that because mm -hmm. I was on the road and there was nothing of interest. So. Mm -hmm. But there's this, and I, there's another thing in Santa Barbara I'm going to do hopefully soon, which is kind of cool too. Do they just call you or is there like a... a, a well, I, a, I, I work for a company. Okay. Know? So I'm on their call list. I'm not on the staff or anything like that. But yeah. They have jobs that... I might be suitable for or interested in then connect. Right. I don't like doing, they do a lot of prehistoric stuff. And I, I don't know. Like finding fossils? Well, no, Native American stuff. Uh, the, the mm -hmm. Methodology and the, um, the cultural material is not as interesting to me. I like the lighter stuff, I like this stuff, and like, you know, just trash dumps with old bottles and ceramics and bones. Yeah. The, 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 the real stuff of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's sick. <clears throat> well, I guess I'll pack up. All right. <laughs> and there you go. That concludes episode three of Subcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe, and do all the things. Hit the bell or whatever if you're on YouTube. I don't know. Just get the word out. We're doing a thing here. We're talking to humans. And we're having a good time. Here's some links. And we'll see you next week.